Welcome to Dateline Health. Uh, this is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. And you know, I always say to you that this is your show. And there's been a lot of comments relative to uh, vascular issues. And it's, it's a very broad field, but we're going to talk about it here. And it also sort of coincides with, you know, I always tell you that the three number one topics that, are, that we get from you happen to be cardiac disease, cancer, and minimally invasive techniques. Those are the three <laughs> items that... So I said to myself, we had a lot of questions on vascular issues, and I know that you all are exceptionally involved with minimally invasive techniques. So I'm going to let you introduce you to our folks out there. Sitting in front of me is Dr. Rafael Bustamante. He's a vascular surgeon at Broward Health Medical Center. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Good to have you. Pleasure. And Dr. Joseph Habib, uh, who is also a vascular surgeon at Broward Health Medical Center. And uh, welcome to you. Appreciate the opportunity. Good to have you. So tell us about vascular surgery, Dr. Bustamante. <laughs> You know, vascular surgery in our field is the study and uh, surgical intervention of basically arteries and veins all over the body with the exception of the brain and the heart. You know, so we're able to treat vascular disease in the upper extremities, up to the wrist, even sometimes into the hand, and all the way down into the foot. Okay, so we both employ minimally invasive techniques to treat these diseases, as well as traditional open operations to treat these diseases as well. Dr. Habib, I know that you're uh, new to this area, but not really. You're a veteran. Uh, talk to us about the, um, the capabilities that uh, minimally invasive techniques have brought to vascular surgery. It's it's a growing, changing field, and in the old days where you would have to make large incisions across the abdomen, the belly, or um, the neck, the legs, large bypasses, what we're able to do now is angioplasty and stenting um, through different access points. Um, for example, we can go through the wrists now and treat the legs with balloons or stents to help open blockages to help improve blood supply to the legs. We can go through small arteries in the foot and go retrograde up the leg. Um, a lot of um, new technologies um, have come out regarding um, drug eluding or um, like an anti-cancer drug on the balloon that's actually delivered into the blood vessel that helps keep things open for a longer amount of time. We're able to re repair aortas, big aneurysms through almost band-aid needle stick type surgeries or even um, stents uh, into the carotid artery um, delivered through the arteries in your groin. Um, so everything is changing um, and and the technology is advancing every day. It's, it's a very exciting field and a very, um, very unique um, opportunity we have that we're able to treat things both minimally invasive as well as open so we can bring both to the table whenever it's indicated or necessary. I would assume <clears throat> that uh, both of you feel that uh, with, with all the accumulated knowledge and time and study and and uh, residencies and fellowships and whatever you go through to become uh, capable and adroit in doing what you're doing, that the uh, the advent, of, uh, particularly over the last, I guess, 10 to uh, maybe 20 years, uh, of, of minimally invasive techniques and stenting. No, absolutely. You know, um, some some procedures... In terms of in, in involving, let's say, abdominal aortic aneurysms per se, the traditional method still holds value to this day, meaning the, long, the large incision, going into the abdom, abdomen, replacing that segment of artery. But these days, the way we do it is through essentially needle puncture holes into the artery. So those risks associated with those large open operations 
are not involved with the needle hole puncture sticks. So there's always a risk benefits ratio that we look at. Again, if the patient's anatomy is not coincident with the stent grafts th these days, or if they have extensive calcifications in some of the arteries that we cannot deliver these stent grafts, then the advantage that Dr. Shabi and myself have is that we could offer the traditional open operation and vice versa. One of the things that I, I, we keep getting questions on is uh, abdominal uh, issues. I want you to talk about the, the responsibility that they have to be uh, scanned and diagnosed, all right? Uh, but I would assume that you're mitigating so much of that problem. Is that true, Dr. Habib? Yes. Uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm is, has a very high um, morbidity and mortality associated with it. So in terms of the screening, Medicare will pay for a once, um, one-time only ultrasound of the aorta, which is essentially um, a low-risk um, procedure where you put gel on the uh, belly and just look with an ultrasound probe. And so having that early detection um, is very advantageous where we can treat the aneurysm before it ruptures. Um, just as like you're inflating a balloon with air, the larger and larger it gets, the weaker the wall becomes to the point where it can rupture. So um, back in, um, say, 20, 30 years ago, we were only able to do the open operation for patients with ruptured aneurysms, but now uh, patients come in and we can put a balloon up to stop the bleeding before um, we'd have to open the entire belly, move the intestines out of the way, and then clamp the aorta. So the timing is, is much less. And, you know, when you're dealing with major blood loss and um, a very fragile situation, being able to do things in a very expeditious fashion is advantageous to having a good outcome. Um, so we can depending on the anatomy, we can deliver the stent grafts, um, which is essentially like a chain link fence, but it's covered in fabric. So it's essentially like relining a pipe um, versus in the old days, we'd have to replace the entire segment of the aorta. Uh, patients would be in the hospital at least weeks, maybe even months recovering. Um, whereas now we could repair that and they could go home the next day. Yeah, well, that that's, again, that's the question, you know, again, not to get too graphic about it, but, you know, a lot of the questions that come in about abdominal uh, aortic aneurysms, uh, and again, it's, it has to do with uh, my sister, my grandmother, my mother, my mother, well, you know, it's always nobody but yourself, but they, they have not been really viewed, in other words, they have not had the sonographic mm -hmm. uh, attempt to see what's bothering them. But also, you know, as I mentioned before, the percentage of number of, of mature individuals, I never say elderly because I'm in that area. I would assume that uh, you're both advocating really for them to see their primary care physician and, and get these things viewed as quickly as possible. No, of course, you know, like Dr. Habib alluded to in the treatment of ruptured aneurysm, the whole mantra of our field is to prevent that episode, you know. So it starts early. The things that we have to take into account is the risk factors that are associated with abdominal aneurysms, which one of the biggest risk factors, excuse me, risk factors is smoking. You know, before now, you really have to have... The recommendations to screen in the past have become so lax. In the past, you needed a set number of cigarettes to qualify for medical for I mean for screening. Now you just need to be you just need to have a history of smoking a cigarette. High blood pressure is another significant risk factor. There are studies that have shown even diabetes have shown to be a protective risk factor for abdominal aortic aneurysms. No one really knows the true mechanism of that. But we try to capture those. Old, those those um, older 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 populations with any history of smoking, as well as any history of family members with aneurysms, because there is some evidence that is some genetic predisposition to 
gaining, I'm too obtaining an uh, aneurysm per se. So those are the main targets that, that we need to, or that that population needs to be aware of that they need to have themselves checked by an ultrasound. And I would assume, obviously, they, they eventually get into your qualified, educated mm -hmm. hands and mind, because it's not just hands. I, I always said surgeons, it's not just hands, it's what's here and what's what you see. Uh, so I, um, I would assume that uh, it, it, it's, in a way, uh, very satisfying to you to know that you're able to prevent their, uh, the mortality, uh, increase their mortality and prevent uh, certain death. True? True, agree. I think um, in terms of um, the screening, uh, that definitely has been shown to decrease mortality, early detection. Um, ultrasounds of the carotids. Um, we also do um, a measurement of blood pressure, um, a ratio from the arms to the feet, so we can detect um, in a very simple way if the blood flow is, if the circulation to the lower extremities is not adequate. So these are all very um, non invasive, non risk procedures that we can do to detect vascular disease and. Um, Again, early detection and prevention is the key to success. Um, I like to always say the root cause of the majority of disease we treat is smoking cessation or smoking. So I always am very adamant with my patients and try to get them help in terms of how to achieve smoking cessation. Also, lifestyle modifications, exercise, as you were alluding to, diet. Um, uh, blood pressure control, keeping their diabetes under control. These are all preventative measures so that I'm not treating somebody who um, has not had their comorbidities modified. Um, and like you're saying, the, the technical aspect is definitely important. Um, surgeons definitely must have skilled hands and, and good technique. But Again, it, it also boils down to judgment and indications and um, doing things for the right reasons um, that will benefit patients. Uh, I always look at the long-term uh, outcome of this patient over a series of years um, rather than just an immediate fix. So I look at the patient globally. I'm able to offer the medical management the minimally, minimally invasive techniques, as well as the old, uh, the open um, operations. So I think that gives us um, an advantage that we can treat the entire spectrum of disease with so uh, one-stop shop, so to speak. It's interesting that you just brought to the conversation a question that one of our viewers had about um, circulatory issues. Uh, there. They're feeling in their hands, you know, this, uh, this numbness in the fingers. But, you know, no place else. You know, maybe, maybe it's from the wrist down. Uh, it's, I, I don't know. You just, you just brought it to the table. So, I mean, that so was one of the questions that came from the... There, there's a wide variety of causes um, for something like that. Um, numbness and tingling could point to vascular issues, so I definitely um, could see that happening, but also um, it could be a neuropathic issue um, yeah. where the nerve, like carpal tunnel or something in the shoulder impingement on the nerve that's just causing a particular numbness in the hand, but all of that is needs to be um, elucidated with a good clinical exam and, if needed, imaging. Um, there are ultrasounds you could do of the upper extremity, very non-invasive, very low-risk procedures that could help define what exactly is going on there. Dr. Bustamante? No, exactly. Is you know, numbness is, we see these patients in the office all the time. You know, I have a numbness on my toes, a um, little discoloration. But the thing with vascular disease is that it's all interconnected. Could be, it could be neuropathic issues such as that poorly controlled diabetes. It could be nerve issues, impingement of the nerves in the arms and in the, even in, higher in the neck or in the spine. So those could produce those types of symptoms of numbness. The thing that we need to 
rule out is any arterial insufficiency that could be causing those symptoms, such as a blocked artery or stenotic artery. So that's when we bring to the table that we could provide these non-invasive studies to at least have take a look at how the circulature is. Again, diabetes in general needs to be controlled adequately, adequately because once the patients start having this peripheral neuropathy or or dam or my or microvascular damage to the nerves, that's almost to the point that there's not much that we could offer when it gets to that point. And another another question you brought uh, you brought to the table, Doctor Habib, uh, there was a question about uh, carotid. There's a lot of questions actually about carotid arteries. Uh, you know, uh, getting pain in my neck and my ears hurting, things of that nature. And there's some for somehow somewhere along the line. I don't know what the, the chain of communication was through their primary care physician or otherwise, but I, I would assume there's a lot of that. That uh, according to what I'm hearing from the patients, from the viewers, there must be a lot of that happening. No, of course. And again, some of the there's only a few conditions in our specialty that we treat for patients who do not have symptoms for is one is aneurysm disease that we discuss, and then the other is carotid artery disease. Because if left untreated, and that could lead to more debilitated conditions such as a large stroke. So we also advocate screening for carotid artery disease, you know, because the symptoms for those are not localized symptoms to the ears, but more, more devastating symptoms such as a stroke-like symptoms or uh, what's called a mini stroke where patients complain, doc, I'm, you know, for five, 10 minutes the other day, I couldn't move one side of my body. You know, those are clues that give, that let us lead to that diagnosis. But again, screening is, is, is the name of the game here, is to find it before it finds you. Dr. Habib, anything to add to that? Well, one, one of the reasons why I went into vascular surgery was the, um, the gravity of the situations and the amount of benefit we're able to deliver to patients. So with carotid disease, we're either preventing a stroke, with aneurysmal disease, we're preventing a death, and with treatment of peripheral arterial disease, we're essentially preventing limb loss. So it's a very gratifying field. I almost go through every emotion on a daily basis, exhilaration, depression, um, lack of sleep, energy. But in the end, it's extraordinarily rewarding. And the new techniques um, in terms of carotid disease, um, before we had to make an incision across the neck um, and then actually open the artery, clean it out, and then put a patch on it to prevent it from re-blocking off. Now, um, in some patients that are super high risk or that their anatomy allows us to just deliver a stent to open that blockage up, and being able to offer both techniques puts us in a very advantageous position that we could select what is best for the patient, whereas somebody that just does stenting or just does open operations may be swayed one direction or another. So I find it very um, rewarding to be able to deliver that level of care. Before I forget, uh, are you both located in uh, the medical office buildings at uh, yes. Broward Health? Yes. Uh, yes. Both of you. So that's immediately attendant to Broward General, correct? Yes. Uh, okay, well, I just want to make sure because we want people, people are going to ask us, where do we find Dr. Habib? Where do we find Dr. Bustamante? And I, I just thought of it because uh, often uh, I... Sometimes I, I, I forget to ask people, where, where are you located? You know, sometimes it's a private office and you're associated with, for example, in this case, Broward Health Medical Center. But if you're both in the medical office building, which is immediately attendant to the hospital, it makes it a, a heck of a lot easier. Uh, relative, again, to the issue of, uh, I, I know there's been a, a, a tremendous change in the uh, the operative, uh, the operation room, the ORs, uh, they they've become very um, collaborative. Co community, you know, there's you, because there are other healthcare professionals that you deal with. Uh, I'm I'm sure multiple times uh, during your uh, communications, uh, and some of them are uh, 
technique individuals, surgical techniques and otherwise. Is it, is it, I, I know that, that the new uh, uh, operating room procedural uh, values are, are dramatic uh, because I know that there, there was a lot of work that was put into new operating rooms at uh, Broward Health. No, of course. The main operating room that we both operate on is called a hybrid room, right? which is essentially a large room where we could offer both minimally invasive and open techniques in the same setting, same patient. If, for instance, there is a, a scenario where we need to clean the artery in the groin, we could do that there, as well as in the same setting, put a stent in an artery in the belly. So it's very advantageous in us that we could use the tools, give the tools that are looking in Broward General to provide those type of therapies for patients. The patients that go to their other hospitals migrate to your facility, or they you have brethren that are at those other facilities. No, well, usually the patients will come to our facilities because that's where we have the hybrid room capabilities in Broward right. General. That's why I asked about yeah. the hybrid room. See, you thought I was just fishing, but I wasn't. I wanted to get directly to that. Dr. Abib, I know that you're, um, uh, well, you're not new to this area, but you are new to this area. I know that you were at the University of Florida for a number of years. Uh, they, they, too, uh, they have an advantage because it's a state university system. Uh, but uh, I, it's really interesting to see how the healthcare system in South Florida. We have for profits, not for profits. You know uh, this whole mixture, but yet there's been a, a really a, a surge in people recognizing that they don't have to travel to New York, Boston, Texas, Chicago, whatever, to receive the, the highly skilled technical medical professional care that they receive at venues such as yours. Do you feel that way? I, I totally agree. Um, so one of the um, main reasons why I accepted the position with Broward and agreed to come down other than loving the weather and the water was that we really don't have any restrictions um, based on, we treat everybody regardless of insurance, regardless of payment. Uh, Broward Health offers us that luxury where we don't have to um, deliver services for any sort of financial incentive. Um, also, Dr. Bustamante and I work very well together and 90% of the cases we do, we'll scrub together. And um, so you're essentially getting two surgeons for the price of one. Um, we're able to deliver a high level of care with state-of-the-art facilities, our hybrid room. Um, and our offices, again, are just across the street. So we're, we work very well together. We're very cohesive. Um, irrespective of any sort of payer source or disease process, we're able to handle um, just about everything that walks in the door with a high level of expertise and good outcomes. Dr. Bustuante? No, I agree. You know, again, the best part is the collaborative approach. You know, Dr. Habib and myself, we, we look at every film together. We put our heads together to see what's the best treatment option, whether it's open, endovascular, whether this patient needs a bypass or can we get through with a stent. You know, so patients get two board certified vascular surgeons for the price of one. We work together, we do our cases together, and we complement each other in certain aspects. You know, so again, the also, with the facilities that we have at Broward, at Broward General, we have the hybrid room capabilities, and there's always there's always room that we're trying to expand this service line as well. So this is just the tip of the iceberg that we're touching in terms of treating or developing a center for vascular disease. And you know, another wonderment, and I, I didn't want to leave this out, but you know, and I talk about I, I won't talk about a specific hospital. But you know, the, if you talk about the, the whole South Florida region, you know, Dade, Broward, Palm Beach County, uh, it's been, there's been such a change in the availability of services. It's, it's unbelievable over the last 10, 12 years. Uh, but there is also a foci 
on the nursing staff and the attendant staff that supports you. And I really think that that's a major issue in hospital stay and hospital care. I don't know, that's, that's my view of it because I, you know, knowing that hospitals are trying desperately to bring higher technology, more qualified nursing professionals into their system is a, is a goal of what I would see the general medical community of South Florida trying to attempt to do. And I, I think it helps you, it supports you, you do your, your wonderment of, of practice, but yet you leave that patient whatever time, whether it's 24 hours, 48 hours, 30, whatever it is, in the hands of individuals who are skillful and uh, are, are really your partners. That's the way I see it. Do you agree? 100%. Um, a surgeon is an island. There are so many people that factor into um, having a good outcome uh, for our operations from the perioperative nursing staff to the interoperative nursing staff to the anesthesiologists that keep our patients maintained under anesthesia to the ICU nurses, the floor nurses, and, and even outside of the hospital. So in order to have good outcomes, the system has to be in place and very collaborative, and I agree. Well, we're down to the last 15 seconds of the show, so I, I'd like to get more, but you agree, Dr. Bustamante? Absolutely, absolutely. There's no, there's no I in team. Okay. Well, folks, I hope we answered your questions relative to vascular surgery. I, I try to bring up the items that were questionable and I knew that would fit into their, the, the minds and the trained, uh, not only minds, bodies, but really souls that are built into uh, good physicians. So thank you both very, very much. Dr. Joseph Habib, uh, MD, a, a vascular surgeon at Broward Health Medical Center, and Rafael Bustamante, MD, vascular surgeon at Broward Health Medical Center. Thank you both very much for being here. Folks, I hope that we answered your questions. Remember, there's an email address and a telephone number right there. Got any questions? Call us. Remember, you got to take good care of yourself. And the way you do it, you got to get scanned because something might show up where these folks can do their work. Uh, this show is called Dateline Health. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. My name is Fred Lipman. Until next time, see ya.